Executive Project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margo. And for any first timers, this is a true crime podcast that focuses on murders committed by military members and veterans, and sometimes their family members. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen. I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Join me today as I take you back to a very tragic day in New Orleans history, circa 1973. The day a sniper bunkered down atop the Howard Johnson Hotel in downtown NOLA. But today's story is not just about the sniper who is a veteran. My story is also about another man, another military man who chose to stand up to that insanity. And without proper permission, he saved the day with his military helicopter. Today, I will discuss the sniper Navy veteran Mark Jimmy Essex. But more importantly, I will praise the hero, the Marine's Marine, the late Lieutenant General Charles Chuck Pittman, who saved the day. Now, let's dig in. Today's sources include articles from the Pensacola News Journal, The Advocate, Times Picayune, Stars and Stripes, WeAreTheMighty.com, Lieutenant General Pittman's official biography, Mark Essex Murderpedia page and a book by Leonard Moore titled Black Rage in New Orleans. Mark James Robert Essex, a.k.a. Jimmy, was born on August 12, 1949 to Mark and Nellie Essex. Mark Sr. was an Army veteran and Mark Jr., the focus of today's case, he grew up in Emporia, Kansas. He was the second of five kids, and he came from a working class family. His father, after the military, was a foreman at a meat packing company, and his mother worked for the Head Start Center. Jimmy was polite and an overall average student. He wanted to go into mechanics, and he also had dreams of becoming a minister. He joined the Navy in January of 1969 as a dental tech. And according to author Leonard Moore, Jimmy joined the Navy at the advice of his father because He felt, meaning his father, his father felt that the Navy was the least racist. It's important to note for this particular story that Jimmy was black. Jimmy was a smart cookie too. He scored in the top 25% of the Navy entrance test, which is how he got the dental tech gig. As a dental tech in California, San Diego to be exact, he was the first black sailor to hold that position, but he seemed to get along great with everyone. However, Jimmy couldn't overlook the racism that he witnessed on a daily basis while in the Navy. It was evident to him that white sailors could do whatever they pleased, but black sailors were highly scrutinized and experienced a lot of backhanded comments and abuse. Well, on Jimmy's 21st birthday, he had had enough and he got into a physical altercation with a white sailor. And from that moment forward, something changed. It like clicked in Jimmy. He felt that if he was going to do everything right and still get in trouble only because of the color of his skin, then he was sick and tired of being a rule follower. Jimmy put up with the racism for almost two years. And then from October 19th through November 16th, 1970, he went AWOL, which is absent without leave. During this time, he went back to Kansas and he took the time to clear his mind because he really began to hate white people. But his parents and pastor encouraged him, listen, Jimmy, go back to the Navy. Well, Jimmy returned and the Navy wanted to clean their hands of Jimmy. You can't just disappear and expect things to go back to normal, especially in the military. So on February 10th, 1971, Jimmy, only 21 years old at the time, was officially kicked out of the Navy due to unsuitability of character and behavior issues. Jimmy then moved to New York for three months where he got involved with the Black Panthers movement. Then, after those three months, Jimmy moved back to Kansas for a few months to be close to his family. It was there that he bought a gun and practiced target shooting every single day. It was nonstop. His family thought that they had lost him. They realized 
how much their happy-go-lucky boy had changed since joining the Navy. Jimmy soon moved to New Orleans to get training on how to be a repairman. Jimmy was getting more and more agitated, though, with the injustices that he perceived to have experienced in the Navy. And the injustice didn't end when he left the Navy. Now, on the civilian side, he was experiencing the same exact thing. During a civil rights protest at Southern University, which is a historically black college in Baton Rouge, in November of 1972, two students, Leonard Brown and Denver Smith, were killed by police. I looked into this and it was a very, very tragic story that preceded the students of Southern boycotting classes for a month. Basically, they wanted to be treated with the same respect as students from white colleges. And if you want more information on this event, you should watch the PBS special by filmmaker Stanley Nelson called, quote, Tell Them We're Rising, the story of black colleges and universities, end quote. When Jimmy heard about the two students being murdered during a protest, he flipped a lid. He realized he could no longer just sit back and watch the abuse any longer. Between Christmas Day and New Year's Eve, Jimmy wrote two letters. The first letter was a note to his parents. The note read, quote, Africa, this is it, mom. It's even bigger than you and I, even bigger than God. I have now decided that the white man is my enemy. I will fight to gain my manhood or die trying. End quote. The second letter was sent to WWL TV, which is a New Orleans NBC affiliate. And that note read, quote, the downtown New Orleans Police Department will be attacked. Reasons many, but the deaths of two innocent brothers will be avenged and many more. P.S. Tell Pig Giaruso the felony action squad ain't shit. End quote. The letter was signed, quote, Maha, which in Swahili means a weapon. Well, due to the holidays, this second letter to the TV station, which should have acted as a warning, was not opened until after the bloodbath that was about to come. On December 31st, 1972, Jimmy hid near the New Orleans Central Lockup, a.k.a. the local jail, and he had a bone to pick. He shot and killed an African-American cadet named Alfred Harrell Jr. This cadet died immediately. He was guarding the jail gate. Well, Jimmy also shot and wounded Lieutenant Horace Perez. Jimmy then fled and tried to break into a nearby warehouse. While he was attempting to break into the warehouse, he tripped the alarm and the police arrived, not realizing that this was the man that had just sniped one of their own. Unaware of how dangerous Jimmy was, the two officers outside were about to release their canine when Jimmy ambushed the police officers and severely injured Officer Edwin Hosley Sr., who would die two months later. Jimmy then fled again. During this time, the city of New Orleans was experiencing a race war. It was blacks versus whites. But when three cops had been shot in the span of minutes, the police needed all of the citizens' help every single one of them. Police Superintendent Clarence Giruso tried to defuse the race war. And he basically said, hey, listen, this isn't about race. A black cadet was shot. I mean, goodness gracious, this isn't about race at all. The person behind these brutal attacks is someone against law and order. We need your help. Then they offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. The following day, Jimmy broke into the first New St. Mark Baptist Church looking for cover. He spent a few days there, maybe two or three nights. And then one night, the church pastor walked into the church and found Jimmy there. But the pastor slowly backed out and was able to call the police. But when police arrived, Jimmy was gone. In the women's restroom, the police found a cloth sack filled with 38 caliber rounds, Then they found bloodstains on various doors and windowsills and more blood outside. But before Jimmy left the church, he wrote the pastor a note. It read, quote, I am sorry for breaking the lock on your church door. But pastor, at two o'clock, I felt I had to get right with the Lord. You see, I was a sinner then walking past your church. I was drinking. I then broke the door and fell on my knees in prayer. Now I have managed to get it together. I will send you the money for the new lock. God bless you, end quote. 
It appeared that Jimmy injured his hand when he broke into the warehouse and then again when he broke into the church. So looking all disheveled and with blood on his clothing, he walked into a local grocery store to buy some bandages. The store owner, Joe Pernicario, I'm not sure if I said that right, he recognized Jimmy as the potential shooter the cops were looking for and he reported Jimmy, but the cops didn't find him. But Jimmy, somehow he knew that the store owner, Joe, had just busted his location. So on January 7th, 1973, Jimmy again walked into the grocery store, saw Joe and yelled, quote, you, you're the one I want. Come here, end quote. And then he shot Joe with a 44 caliber Magnum carbine. Then Jimmy fled and carjacked a man named Marvin Albert. He then drove to the 18 story Howard Johnson Hotel located at 330 Loyola Avenue in downtown New Orleans across the street from the city hall. He parked on the fourth floor of the hotel parking deck and took the stairs. He kept trying to get into the building, into the hotel, but he couldn't get in because the doors were locked. Jimmy rustled with the door and then knocked and a maid let him in, not realizing the danger she had just let into the hotel. As he walked to the roof, he came across three African-American housekeepers and they were startled. He was wearing fatigues and holding a gun, but he told them, listen, don't worry because I'm only here to kill white people. The maids quickly called authorities. Meanwhile, Jimmy was on the top level of the hotel and he bumped into two newlyweds by the elevator, Dr. Robert Stiegel and Betty Stiegel. The two men struggled, but Jimmy gained the upper hand, shot Stiegel in the chest and then shot Betty in the head as she cried over her dying husband's body. After he murdered the couple, Jimmy had access to the room. So he set a fire and then left a pan-African flag next to their bodies. He then made his way to various other rooms, setting more fires along the way. Eventually, the hotel management had heard about what was going on and they called first responders and then they went looking across the hotel. Just then, Jimmy bumped into the hotel manager, Frank Schneider, and the assistant manager, Walter Collins, killing them both, although Collins wouldn't die until three weeks later. Jimmy continued setting fires in multiple rooms at the hotel. His plan all along was to lure first responders and then massacre anyone that came near. At some point, Jimmy found himself in the swimming pool area. And just as Robert Beamish was about to get into the pool, Jimmy shot him in the stomach. Robert fell into the pool, but managed to survive, although it would be hours, hours before anyone could get to him to offer help. By this point, firefighters were on ladders outside the hotel trying to put out the fires. And just then Jimmy thought, huh, exactly as I had planned. Jimmy took aim at the firefighters on their ladders and began to shoot at them. They were practically sitting ducks. One firefighter was shot in the arm and would eventually live. But after months and months of physical therapy and no progress, he would have his arm amputated. By noon, Jimmy became restless from all the hustling and bustling, and he tried to get back to his stolen car in the parking garage. He was trying to escape. But when he tried, it was being guarded by police officers. So there was some fire exchange between Jimmy and the police officers, and Jimmy retreated higher and higher into the building until he made it to the rooftop. He was on the roof watching as everyone approached. He had the perfect position. He had the high ground. From this position, he shot and killed three cops. Phil Coleman, Paul Persigo, and the New Orleans Police Department Deputy Superintendent, Louis Sergo. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus Multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. 
so you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. And this was a full-blown shootout that went from about 3 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. But it started at about 10.15 in the morning, right there in the downtown area of New Orleans. Remember, this was right across the street from the city hall and the courthouse, but this was a Sunday. Occasionally, onlookers could hear Jimmy shout, quote, power to the people, end quote. It was full-blown chaos. Cops tried to return fire, but Jimmy was completely shielded in his well-thought-out location on the rooftop. News quickly spread about the situation. Remember, this was the 70s. So I read that local reporters were on nearby payphones reporting back to their stations exactly what was happening. A local DJ caught on to the story, asked citizens with large caliber rifles, to help the cops. Basically, he said, everybody who has a gun, round yourselves up and go to the Howard Johnson Hotel, which I think is crazy. Now, this news was on every single channel. For those of us not yet born in the early 70s, I envision this moment in New Orleans history like the 9-11 Twin Towers attack. I remember on 9-11 coming home that day, turning on the TV and videos of the towers were showing on every single channel. There was no escape. There was no hiding it. And all that most of us could do was just sit on our couches, speechless and helpless. One such onlooker was 12-year-old John Allen Muhammad, aka the DC sniper, who lived in nearby Baton Rouge. But more on him on a future episode. Well, there was another person who was watching this news unfold on January 7th, 1973. And this person couldn't just sit by and do nothing. This person was 37-year-old U.S. Marine Lieutenant Colonel Charles Chuck Pittman. Pittman was a commander of the Marine Air Reserve Training in Louisiana. When he turned on the TV and saw the ensuing scene, a gunman sitting on top of a hotel shooting and killing first responders. Pittman was like, what in the hell? He ordered one of his subordinates to call the New Orleans Police Department and see if they would accept their help. Well, at 4 p.m. after hours of trying to contain and capture the gunman, Pittman finally got a call from the New Orleans Police Department saying, yes, 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 please help. That was all that Pittman needed. Pittman sent a note to his superiors, letting them know about the situation and telling them, I'm on my way to help. Well, usually when you ask for permission, you wait for an answer, but there was no time for that. Pittman's mentality was ask forgiveness, not permission. According to a 2013 news article written in NOLA.com, Pittman and the local NOLA Coast Guard did have standing permission to send helicopters to help with local rescue efforts. I mean, they had just helped the locals a few weeks earlier in the case of a high rise fire on November 29th, 1972. And although the current mission was not a rescue mission per se, people were still dying. Pittman grabbed another pilot and two crew members and jumped in a CH-46 Sea Knight, a twin rotor transport helicopter, and headed straight towards New Orleans. Pittman later recalled that due to foggy weather and low visibility, the Coast Guard refused to send helicopters out that day. Pittman went out in his helicopter, not even sure what the heck he was going to do, but there was no way that he was going to sit and watch the news on it. He was an action man. Pittman took to the skies and used his internal map quest to get to the city hall, where he landed the helicopter next to the Howard Johnson Hotel in an empty parking lot and near a pretty famous stadium now known as the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. Well, for whatever reason, when the scene was unfolding earlier in the day, the New Orleans Police Department set up their command center in the hotel lobby where the shooter was at the top of, not realizing that they would be pinning themselves into the building due to the gunman's position atop the building. Well, Pittman got off his helicopter and proceeded to walk, basically waltz, into the Howard Johnson lobby. Later asked why he walked instead of ran, he said... 
duh. I walked because I figured if I ran, I'd only draw sniper fire. <laughs> He's so badass. Well, he arrived and was like, I'm here. I have my helicopter. How can I help? Pittman had served several tours in Vietnam and he was a military officer. This was not a situation he would shy away from. So he took charge. As written by Jocelyn Joseph in the We Are the Mighty article that I read, quote, Essex had the high ground, so Pittman would go higher, end quote. Pittman looked over at the New Orleans police officers and said, get in. I imagine this like a total Arnold Schwarzenegger moment. Get to the job. <laughs> in order to get to a decent position, though, Pittman had to fly between high rise buildings. As Pittman flew over the hotel, he would slow the helicopter and turn so the cops could aim and fire. But they couldn't get a good shot because the shooter would expose himself to shoot at the helicopter. But as soon as the helicopter turned, Jimmy would hide. This went on for hours. And on more than one occasion, the cops on board the Sea Knight ran out of ammo and Pittman had to land and allow them to reload. They were playing a game of cat and mouse, but Pittman lured Jimmy right into his plan. They continued to pass in the helicopter. Jimmy took a few shots and then he'd hide as soon as the helicopter turned to take aim. But in the last flyby, Pittman turned more quickly, catching the sniper exposed. Jimmy shot at the helicopter, hitting above the cockpit and hitting the transmission casing. And the New Orleans officers in another location because it wasn't just a helicopter that had armed police officers taking aim at Jimmy. I found some pictures online of officers on top of other buildings trying to catch the sniper exposed. Well, let's just say it appears that everyone finally got a piece of the sniper when the helicopter made a quick maneuver. At about 9 p.m., Jimmy was finally taken out. It had been 10 hours after Jimmy began his terror. However, even after Jimmy was dead, the police department, they weren't 100% sure that he was the only sniper. So it wouldn't be until the next day after they cleared the entire hotel that they found Jimmy's body. They had to clear each and every single room in the hotel. There was and still is some controversy as to whether Jimmy was the sole terror or if he had an accomplice who got away. When Jimmy's body was later examined, he had over 200 bullet holes on his body. At the end of the day, between December 31st, 1972 and January 7th, 1973, Mark Jimmy Essex killed nine people and injured 13 others. Jimmy's parents later gave an exclusive interview to CBS. When asked why they thought this happened, Mama Bear said, quote, he was mistreated in the Navy. It was prejudice. I don't know if the Navy is doing it deliberately, but they're doing it, end quote. Mark Essex Sr. said, quote, if he had not been mistreated in the Navy, he wouldn't have been gullible or easily influenced by outside influences and he'd be here right now, end quote. Lieutenant Colonel Pittman helped put an end to the terror that Jimmy created on that morning. Pittman was a hero, but for his quick thinking approach, it may have cost the lives of many more first responders. New Orleans Mayor Moon Landry was very thankful. But of course, <laughs> the Marines were pissed. Pittman stole a helicopter. He went on a civilian mission without permission. And what would have happened if the helicopter went down? or if the helicopter caused civilian casualties, it would have been a PR nightmare. Well, the Marines actually contemplated court-martial charges against the New Orleans hero, but Pittman would never actually face a court-martial. Democratic Congressman and House Armed Services Committee Chairman Edward Herbert stepped in and everything turned out just fine for Lieutenant Colonel Pittman. That summer, 1973, Pittman was transferred out of New Orleans to attend Air War College. So not only was Pittman already on an upswing with his career, but it's safe to say that his bravery in the face of civilians really propelled him up the Marine leadership ladder. And of course, everything else that he did in the Marine Corps, because he's just a straight bad A. Seven years after the New Orleans sniper attack, Pittman was in charge of the crews that participated in Operation Eagle Claw, an attempt ordered by President Jimmy Carter to rescue 52 Americans being held hostage in Iran. 
However, the mission ended in a disaster when a helicopter crashed with a transport plane, killing eight American servicemen. This mission would serve as the catalyst for the Department of Defense to really take a hard look at the way joint operations were run. And that's all I'll say about that, or else this will turn into an Air War College podcast, and I'm not about that life. Pittman would continue to lead an amazing Marine Corps career. In 87, he became the Marine Corps Deputy Chief of Staff for Aviation, eventually retiring in 1990 at the rank of Lieutenant General. I just have, I have a question for everyone. Can you imagine if someone today actually had the nerve to do what Pittman did back in 1973? I don't know. I don't know that the result would be the same. I'd be kind of scared. Anyway, I want to take just a few more minutes to talk about Lieutenant General Pittman. Pittman was born in Chicago and he grew up in an orphanage. He was adopted and moved to Wisconsin and learned to fly by the age of 14. He joined the Navy Reserve in 1952 and eventually enlisted in the Marine Corps. In 1954, he entered flight training as a Naval Aviation Cadet, and he received his wings in 1955. He flew 1,200 missions during the Vietnam War, and his helicopter was shot down seven times. He suffered a 50 caliber bullet wound to one of his legs. According to the We Are the Mighty article that I read, Lieutenant General Charles Chuck Pittman His career spanned 40 years. In addition to his time in Vietnam, he commanded an air wing and was a deputy chief of staff for Marine Corps Aviation. He received the Silver Star for extracting 16 recon personnel from the mountains of Vietnam under conditions of darkness, bad weather, and heavy enemy fire. He also received four distinguished flying crosses, a bronze star with a combat V, a purple heart, and 65 air medals. On November 8th, 1991, he became an honorary New Orleans Police Department captain. 40 years after the sniper attack, NOLA.com interviewed Pittman and asked him, why, why did you do it? He said, quote, I enjoyed the excitement, being in dangerous situations. I didn't necessarily like killing anybody, but I liked being a part of the action. I was used to the sounds of battle, the fog of war, end quote. The Howard Johnson Hotel still exists today. However, it is now a Holiday Inn. After Jimmy killed all those officers, Louisiana reinstated the death penalty for crimes involving police officers. This case, this case sucks in so many ways. We cannot excuse the racism that existed, nor the racism that still exists in so many places across the world today. However, we also cannot excuse citizens taking actions into their own hands, as Mark Jimmy Essex did during his one week of terror. However, I am so grateful for heroes like Pittman who did exactly that. He took matters into his own hands for good. About his father, Charles Pittman Jr. said, quote, the thing with him was, if you're going to be a Marine, you've got to do what you've got to do. He was always happy that he did what he did, end quote. Lieutenant General Pittman recently passed away after a long battle with cancer. He is survived by his wife and his four children. If you're in the military and you experience discrimination due to race, color, national origin, religion, gender, or sexual orientation, contact your local Military Equal Opportunity Program, In True Crime Army, ultimately, we can all be a part of the solution. Don't be a bigot. It's that easy. Have a great week, everyone. You can find me on social, on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast, on Facebook at Military True Crime, and Twitter at Military Murder. This show was created and produced by Mama Margot Productions, and the music was created by TyOps. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. <laughs> Shh, let's work another podcast.